Anybody have a question? All right. Um, so I want to do Fermi on boson scattering today. And so that means that we'll have to remember what the spinners are and um, we'll have to derive the propagator for spin one half particles. Um, so let's see. I think the best thing is to, I guess, review what the Fermi field looks like. It's, uh, let me write a subscript there. Alpha goes from 1 to 4 integral dqp 2 pi q root 2, well, I wrote p0 here, or e and p either way. Um, this is then u, I'm going to write it this way, alpha sub s of p a of P and S, I think this is probably the clearest way to do it, is the minus I PX plus V uh, alpha S of P, P dagger of P and S, E to the I PX. Okay. This, of course, is psi plus. And the second one is psi minus, and I put in the subscript alpha for clarity. Um, here I'm thinking of a direct field, but it doesn't really matter very much. The spinner part is entirely the same, and frankly, the Feynman diagram is basically the same. So this is um, a one of P and S plus I and two of P and S in as much as if you have a complex direct field then, or I can say a direct field as opposed to a minor run field, it's always true that you've got two particles of the same mass and P dagger of P and S is smaller root two. A one dagger of P and S plus I and two dagger and um, so this is the creation operator for the antiparticle. The creation operator for the particle is, of course, the adjoint of that. So that's one over the two. A one dagger of PMS minus I in two dagger. So that's the difference between the particle creation operator and the antiparticle. Okay, um, we can also think of this as field as, a, as two two component fields, C zeta, where C is the left handed, so transforms according to P one half zero and the other one P zero one. Okay, now we derive what these U's are, what these spinners are, and if we look at this, I've written this. I've written this so as to make it like a matrix, okay? Um, it's, but it's a screwy matrix. It's a four by two matrix. Because there are two spin states up and down, but there are four alphas. The reason there are four alphas is that you have, you can have the thing written as a left-handed or a right-handed field. And just let me just for uh, parenthetically and incidentally say that the field is really left-handed only when the field is massless, when the particle is massless. If it's a massive field, then the left-handed field isn't, it transforms according to one half zero, but that doesn't mean that it's really left-handed. It's only left-handed if it's massless. So being really left-handed would have to be its felicity needs to be right. Direction. But if I'm really left-handed, it's only a massless particle that can be really left-handed or really right-handed. Because if it's a massive particle, you can go faster. I mean, if it's left-handed, you go faster and you look at it, 
and now the velocity has changed to this, but the spin is the same. I see, I see. But with left-handed, it can. And, um, and, uh, all right. Um, so this matrix U alpha S of P is, we, we derived this in the notes which are on uh, Wigner rotations and how fields transform into Lorentz translations and so forth. It's page 37, actually, of those notes. This is P0 plus M minus P dot S, and this is P0 plus M plus P dot, P dot sigma, not P dot S. So you see that it's a 4 by 2 matrix. And similarly, V of alpha S of P is also a, a 4 by 2 matrix, but it's a different 4 by 2 matrix. It looks like P0 plus M minus P dot sigma times sigma 2, and the other one is minus P0 plus M plus P dot sigma sigma 2. All right. So these are the, those are the two 4 by 2 matrices. And now, because we're going to need them when we do the Feynman propagator, and uh, later when we actually compute cross-sections as opposed to S matrix elements, um, so let me say this is U of P, U dagger of P. And so that is this times its adjoint. And this is then P0 plus M minus P dot sigma, P0 plus M plus P dot sigma. So this is 4 by 2. And now this is times the 2 by 4 matrix, P0 plus M minus P dot sigma, P0 plus M plus P dot sigma. Okay, so that's a 4 by 2 times a 2 by 4, and you wind up with a 4 by 4 matrix eventually. And the 4 by 4 matrix is, by the way, do ask questions uh, in this class because um, fermions are nothing if not tricky. They're always minus signs, and there's no point in not getting it straight. So this is P0 plus M minus P dot sigma squared. But now, when this one hits that one, a, the cross terms cancel. And so it's just P0 plus M squared minus P vector squared, because P dot sigma squared, I will just remind you that P dot sigma squared is P vector squared. And so this is again P0 plus M squared minus P vector squared. That's for that one times that one. And then finally P0 plus M plus P dot sigma squared. So this is altogether the four by four matrix that we get. So it's basically top, top for that first column and the second column we just multiply this into these two guys. So why are we calculating this this product with U and U dagger? Where is this going to Because happen? it's going to show up in the Feynman propagator. And um, it later shows, this thing is called a spin sum. It later shows up when you, if you're, when you're doing cross sections and you uh, take the after value square out of the scattering answer. We'll, we'll see that eventually. Okay. Um, I'll, I'll write this one out explicitly, but it's not all the others. So this is P0 squared plus M squared plus 2M P0. That's from squaring this. And then we get minus 2 P0 plus M 
T dot sigma. So that's what this whole thing um, is. Down here, this squared, you see when you get M squared, I'm sorry, P zero squared minus P squared is M squared. So this thing is 2M squared plus 2M P zero. Similarly, this thing is, and now I'll factor it. It's 2 um, M times P zero plus M. And then down here, um, it's the same thing as this, but with a plus sign. So it's P0 squared plus M squared plus 2M P0 and then plus 2 uh, P0 plus M P dot sigma. So that's the 4 by 4 matrix. And it turns out you can factor this one also and factor this one also. In fact, um, when you factor the whole thing, this turns out to be something simply 2 m plus p0 times p0 minus p dot sigma m m p0 plus p dot sigma. Okay, so that makes it a simple 4 by 4 matrix. M, of course, multiplies the 2 by 2 identity, and then you've got a factor out there. And okay, I'm, I somehow used some ultra sophisticated notation that even I now don't understand. In that, in other words, in some of these spinners, we're going to divide through by this square root and um, all right, so I better get let me, let me try to get that straight. Um, all right, I think the problem here is that I wrote these U's without the spinner, um, the, the extra denominator, because in fact what happens is that this is really U of P, the dagger of P is actually just this matrix, because we divide by these square roots of, um, so this is, all right, let me, let me straighten this out. Um, all right, I used a, 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 a notation which I had forgotten. Um, the spinners that occur here have an extra extra square root of 2 times m plus p0 in them. And um, what do you mean in Pascal Fer? Yeah, what I, all right, what I did in the notes, this was on, what, back on page 20 or so, I wrote u sub p as um, Square root of 2p0 times u of p, and that this was a p0 plus m minus p dot sigma over square root of 2p0 plus m. And, right, so, so these are, these are the, The spinner, um, these are the spinners that actually occur in there. They have an extra square root in there. So the, I think the right way to do it is 
just put the square root into here. So let's put that square root in all of these terms, and then we'll have 1 over the square root squared here. And that means that here this goes away. So let's, let's do it this way. This is a better way of doing it. So in other words, so as not to have a clumsy square root here, put the square root there. That means that these guys have to be divided by the square root. And then, um, okay. so in other words, let me do the same calculation for the, uh, the antiparticle. In that case, we have the spin as V. So we'll say now that V um, of P is the matrix 1 over the square root of 2 M plus P0 times P0 plus M minus P dot sigma sigma 2 and then minus P0 plus M plus P dot sigma sigma 2. So we put that square root in there. And then what we have is V of P, V dagger of P is and I think it's the same calculation. You don't want to see it again, do you? Yeah, okay. okay. So that's what it turns out to be, where, where now these U's and V's are the spinners that actually appear here without messy square root. Okay. Now there's one further step. Namely, there's this gamma zero, which is zero, one, one, zero. And by the way, although I've been complaining about um, um, Professor Schroeder, Jackson Pollock approach to theoretical physics, <laughs> Um, it's, uh, it is true that, the note, that some of the notation they use is nicer. And in particular, Weinberg's choice of the metric means that he has to stick an extra I here in front of all the gamma matrices. He has to make the gamma matrix, has to add the, actually puts in a minus I. And that does sort of mess things up. So in a sense, the Peston Schroeder metric is the natural one for part of physics. And the Weinberg Finley one is the one for. Anyway, that's gamma zero. And what's going to occur is psi bar rather than psi. And so that means that we're going to have u, u dagger gamma zero, which is said to be u, u bar. And there, it would then be just this matrix here times zero, one, one, zero. And you can see that that turns this into um, M uh, P0 plus P dot sigma. And then uh, P0 minus P dot sigma. And then M. So that's, well, I should have done this up here. And so this is, um, as I just wrote, M. P0 plus P dot sigma, P0 minus P dot sigma, M. And now you can rewrite this as um, P slash plus M. And I remember, mind you, the P slash is P sub A, gamma A plus M. Or it just to make it, since we've got all these metrics swirling around, it's P0 gamma 0 minus P dot gamma plus M. That's what that is. Similarly, V of P, and of course this, all of this was U of P, V value of P, and V of P, V bar of P, um, is V, V dagger plus gamma zero, where this is 
E.V. Daga, and it turns out that this is P slash minus M. All right. Are there any questions, or does anybody want me to derive something extra? These look sort of similar to something we derived in the homework. Are they the same, or are they related? Oh, yeah. Okay. Oh, Jesus. Sorry. It's okay. It survived. Okay. It's a Reese's Puller Cup, so you ought to get it. I got it. Okay. Long arm. Any other questions? All right. So now what we're going to do is use this Hamiltonian that is we're creeping toward the standard model, but very slowly. Okay. So this is a neutral spinless field. But now this psi is a spin one-half field, and this is psi and psi bar. So, in fact, what this actually is is G psi daga alpha of X, gamma zero alpha beta psi beta of X phi of X. So that's the expression that we've got for our interaction Hamiltonian. And what we're saying here is psi bar and psi daga. All right. So we're going now. The thing that we analyzed last time was psi daga psi phi, where psi was a complex, well, basically a charge field or a complex field, also spinless stuff. Now it's spin one-half. And we can imagine that the diagrams are going to be very similar. And we'll see that that's the case. We're going to have that one and this one. So P1, actually, I call this P2. It would have been smarter to call that K. But I better not change it now. Get everything screwed up. Okay. All right. Well, the fields are as written up here. This is psi. And now what I'll do is I'll write, I'll just write psi bar. Psi bar then is going to be psi bar plus plus psi bar minus. And psi bar plus, say, alpha of x is going to be an integral dqp to phi q root 2dp, say, sum on s b of p and s. This is the empty particle annihilation operator. And then v bar of p. And it's going to be s alpha. Okay. Where alpha then takes four values. S just takes two values. And... Was there also a sum in the definition of psi up here? Oh, yeah, for sure. I mean, in general, I just... Minus one half to one half is one way of thinking of it. Or minus or plus or one to two is whatever you like. And then psi alpha minus of x is an integral dqp over 2 pi q through 2 ep sum s a dagger of p and s u bar s well alpha I don't know why it's just a beta in the sum alpha of p wow I left out the phase 
Okay, so I guess we've got all of that straight. Now, do you need another chalk? I don't need any other questions? Is there any other minus on the top one here? Oh, I forgot this. Thank you. All right, let me toss that out. All right, the initial state is going to be P1, S1, P2. So the spinless meson just has a momentum but not a spin index. Square root of 2E P1, 2E P2, A dagger P1, S1. And I was writing it this way, so let's continue. Sometimes I, uh, P and S have the P's and the S's as subscripts, so sometimes I have them as subscripts and sometimes not. Um, the final state is P1 prime, S1 prime, P2 prime, which of course is square root of 2 E P1 prime, 2 E P2 prime, uh, A dagger P1 prime, S1 prime, uh, C dagger of P2 prime, back here. And of course, the field phi of x is phi plus of x plus phi minus of x, and that's the integral dq p to phi q root q e p. Well, I'm going to use q or something, but anyway, c of p is the minus sign of p x plus c dagger of p. So, my right shoulder is now completely useless for the way the race is writing. Um, so, our, our S matrix element to lowest order, well, to all orders, is this. Time order prior to the minus i integral strip h sub i of x e fourth x vacuum and oh not vacuum uh, it's uh, p one s one so lowest order it's uh, a minus i g squared over two one. Square root of two e, all the two e's, and then we have zero a of p one s one prime, c of p two prime, and now the lowest order is going to be the integral of the time ordered product of h of x one, h of x two. C of P2, C dagger of P2, uh, A dagger of P1. So that's what it is. All right, now as usual, uh, in fact, in general, let me say, suppose we had done the nth order term. Good luck. Um, anyway, we have an n factorial here from the expansion of the exponential. We have an n factorial. But then we have um, we have n identical terms here, and we could basically um, use we could basically use any of the what do I want to say this? In other words, we could use say h of x sub k 
to do something, or we could use h of x of j to do the same thing. And so effectively, we have n factorial different, different mathematical expressions that this thing generates. And so you just pick one set and cancel the n factorial. So what we're going to do is we're going to pick that um, we're going to stop uh, C dagger of P2 at X2 and then get a factor of 2 there. So that means that our S matrix element is going to be minus G squared square root of 2 means vacuum A of 1 prime S1 prime C of P2 prime. At least with these simple like second order diagrams, does this have to do, the fact that this 2 just goes away, does this have to do with the fact that these things sort of have a symmetry when you reflect them? That is, I could write that one or I could write the reflected one. Those are the two things. You mean drawing? Oh, sorry. You're drawing. So that well, here, here what we've done, we said this is x2, and this is x2, and this is x1, and this is x1. If we had kept the two here, then we would have generated two more diagrams. They'd be reflected. With x1 and x2 and change. Okay. change. One more talk. So now we have integral time bar of pi, and now psi bar x1, psi x1. But now since we're going to stop the particle, we'll stop the neutral boson at x2, we have to start it again at x1. So this has to be phi minus x1. And then we have psi bar x2, psi x2, and then phi plus of x2, because we're stopping it, stopping the neutral boson at x2. So this is C dagger of P2, A dagger of P1, X1. Okay. And well, we know what these things are. They come from these ones here. So the annihilation creation operator will kick out a 2 pi cube and um, we'll get these factors of 1 over root 2e and we'll get two phase factors left over. And when we do that, what we get is minus uh, g squared square root of 2e but now we're dividing by square root of 2e P2, 2e, P2 prime, and we have A of P1 prime, S1 prime. This is, this is gone. Time order product, psi bar of X1, psi of X1, psi bar of X2, psi of X2, A value of P1, S1, vacuum. And now E to the I X1 P P2 prime minus I X2 P2. All right. And of course D fourth X1 D fourth X2. That's also true here. Of P2 
T1S1 is stopped at S2. Okay. The reason I'm doing this in detail, which is repetitive, which may strike you as repetitive, is that there's a minus sign built into the definition of the fermion propagator, and I want to show you why that minus sign comes about. So, this is minus G squared root 2 means over the square root 2 means P2 times 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 P2 
produce this. Now, this, in fact, is zero, A, one prime, one prime, and now I'm going to write out the time order product, theta, x1, zero, minus x2, zero, psi ball, minus x1, psi of x1, psi bar of x2, psi plus of x2, plus theta, x2, zero, minus x1, zero, psi ball, minus x1, psi, sorry, I'm reading the wrong line in my notes. Obviously, this has to be different. Psi bar of x2, psi plus of x2, psi bar minus of x1, psi of x1, a value of t1, s1. Okay, so that's what it is. And okay, so that's the expression. Now, the first part, the action of the psi plus to stop a dagger of p1, s1, um, is, is pretty straightforward because this one just acts directly. This one has to act, but it's got an annihilation operator which we have to move through two fermion fields, so we get two minus signs. That's just a plus sign. And so this whole thing is simply 1 over square root of 2 e p1 e to the minus i x2 p1 a of p1 prime s1 prime. Now this, this time order product, but now is one fewer fermion field. So it is psi bar minus x1 psi x1 psi bar and I'm going to make the index explicit alpha of x2 because what came out of here was a u alpha p1 s1 and I'm going to make that explicit in a minute, but let me first finish this time order product. Theta at x2, 0, minus x1, 0. Psi bar alpha x2, psi bar minus x1, psi x1. And now just vacuum, and now u alpha s1 of one. Okay, so in other words, the psi plus at x2 here. Um, and that psi plus of x2, these two ones, kick out the phase factor, the one with the square root, and then the u alpha s1 of p1. So why do we only add the alpha label to one of these fields? Because this one doesn't have an alpha yet. And or a beta set. This is gonna in other words, when this X guy X2, so. yeah, yeah, yeah. Th th this alpha <coughs> sums on this alpha and this alpha. An alpha sum from one to four. The, maybe what I should have just reminded you of is that if you look at the top board back there, you see that psi alpha psi alpha plus of x and what is it, x uh, 2 is going to be this integral dq to p and so forth pi q root 2 dp but then it's going to be u alpha s 
of P, A of P and S, even minus I, P, X2. So this is the structure that sits here and there. And when the A annihilates this creation operator, it leaves behind a U, alpha S. And there was an alpha here because this thing is psi bar alpha, psi alpha. Psi bar psi. And just as over here, I can make this A to beta. And then this. Well, I screwed up. If I want to put in all these things. So psi bar psi is shorthand for the sum over alpha over A. OK. I think I'm going to skip this board and go to this one. And then if I run out of board, I'll come back and erase that. Or actually, I don't know. Maybe I will erase this. Because I want these things to be. It might help to have them contiguous so that you can see where this minus sign shows up. All right. OK, so this is where the minus sign is going to show up. This psi minus has a creation operator that couples with this guy. But this psi bar minus has a creation operator that couples with this, but only after it's gone through this psi bar minus. So that means there's a plus sign here and a minus sign there. And so, of course, what happens is um, each of them kicks out a phase factor, a 1 over square root of twice the energy, and it kicks out a u bar. And so altogether, what we've got is e to the i x1 to 1 prime minus i x2 p1 over square root of 2 e p1 2 e p1 prime. And now what's left here is a u of p1 sub alpha s1 vacuum. And now theta of x10 minus x20. And now we have psi beta of x1 psi bar alpha of x2. But now minus, I'm writing it extra big for emphasis, theta of x20 minus x10 psi bar alpha of x2 psi beta x1 0. Of times, the u bar that was kicked out is u bar s1 prime beta of p1 prime. So this is the minus sign that occurs naturally. And so that means that what people have done, I don't know who did it, Dyson, Feynman, probably Feynman actually. He wrote it this way, psi bar, the time-ordered product of two Fermi fields, psi beta of x1, 
by bar alpha of X2 defined with an extra minus sign. So it's the mean value in the vacuum of theta X10 minus X20 psi beta of X1 psi bar alpha of X2 minus theta X20 minus X10 psi bar alpha X2 psi beta X1 vacuum. So this is just the definition of the time work product in this case. So this structure here we just rewrite as U bar S1 prime beta of P1 prime vacuum time order product psi beta X1 psi bar alpha X2 U of P1 alpha S1 E to the I X1 P1 prime minus I X2 P1 all of the square roots to E P1 to E P2. Okay. So this whole thing that we started out with which was this which was basically the only thing that we had computed inside S1 is now like this. Okay. So all together then S1 is equal to the two E's of all cancel. We get minus G squared and integral U bar S1 prime beta P1 prime vacuum time order product psi beta X1 psi bar alpha X2 vacuum U alpha S1 of P1 and then E to the I X1 P1 prime plus P2 prime minus I X2 P1 plus P2 and then just P4 X1 P4 X2. Now what we're going to have to do and I don't know if we're going to get it done today I thought I had plenty of time to do it today we're going to have to compute that that's the final propagator for spin one half particles so we'll compute that. But before computing that I want to show you that if we compute S2 we're going to see that we get a similar minus sign occurring. So Feynman wasn't drunk when he introduced this convention. In S2 what we're going to do is I'm going to grab this piece leaving out the phase factor and I'm going to write it then as vacuum A of P1 prime S1 prime time order product psi bar X1 psi plus of X1 now we stop the fermion at X1 psi bar minus X2 psi of X2 A bag of P1 S1 vacuum so we have that and so this is zero let me just write this as A prime because it's getting late and I'm getting tired theta X1 zero minus X2 zero psi bar X1 psi plus X1 psi bar minus X2 psi X2 and then now this time order product is just defined in the usual way as it must be so this is X2 zero minus X1 zero but notice of course it's a time order product of something that's essentially bosonic because it's quadratic in size so this is 
minus x2 psi x2 psi bar x1 psi plus. So I'm again leaving out the stuff that I hired. Okay, now, once again, there's no trouble with this one because this guy annihilates this creation operator. You can't stop that creation operator. The annihilation operator here also stops it, but it has to go through two Fermi fields, but they're both, but you get two minus signs, so it's just a plus sign. And so what we get is u sub alpha s1 of p1 e to the minus i x1 p1. And then what's left is 0 a prime, I'm just going to write it, theta x1 0 minus x2 0 psi bar alpha x1 psi bar minus x2 psi x2 plus theta x2 0 minus x1 0 psi bar minus x2 psi x2 psi alpha bar x1. Now, this one has a creation operator that pairs with this one, but gets a minus sign. On the other hand, this one has a creation operator that pairs with this one, no minus sign. And so what we get is u bar s1 prime theta p1 prime u p1 alpha s1 e minus i x1 p1 plus i x2 p1 prime divided by the square roots 2 e p1 2 e p1. And what's left is vacuum minus theta x1 0 minus x2 0 psi bar alpha x1 psi theta x2 plus theta x2 0 minus x1 0 psi theta x2 psi alpha bar x1. So that's what we have. And you see, once again, you get a relative minus sign. And so we rewrite this then as, well, you can see what we're going to do. We're just going to replace this whole structure by the time order product. Let me just do it here. We're going to replace this by mean value in the vacuum, time order product of psi beta of x2 psi alpha bar of x1. So with this definition, um, this one is this term minus the one with the times reversed. Okay. This is defined as that. In other words, if, if x2 is later than x1, comes in with a plus sign like this. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. I may have screwed this up. Hold on a second. Yes. Oh, that's right. Okay. Right. Right, this is this. Okay. So, so this, so in other words, so this thing here is that. 
All right. This means that S2 is minus G squared to the bar of T1 prime S1 prime beta integral vacuum time order product psi beta of X2 psi bar alpha of X1. Vacuum U alpha S1 of T1 E to the minus I X1 T1 minus T2 time plus I minus I or something. Minus I X2 T2 minus T1 prime and then U for X1 U for X2. All right. So now we have to evaluate the Feynman particle. All right. In evaluating this propagator, there's going to be one trick that we have to get straight. Vacuum time order product psi beta X1 psi bar alpha X2 vacuum. So it's going to be, well, at first it's not tricky at all. It's just that we use these tricks that we already used with this propagator for spin zero field. Because the built-in minus sign Okay. So that's the definition. Now we take advantage, in fact, I'm going to use ditto notation. Ditto, but now we can put in here psi, let's see, this one we can make a plus, I mean a minus, so this one we can make a plus. And then ditto Okay, in other words, I've taken advantage of the fact that this is the mean value of the vacuum, so if I have a positive frequency part here, it annihilates, so we just use the negative here. The negative frequency part has a creation operator, which to the left annihilates, so we just take the positive frequency part. Okay, but if we switch the order here, we get zero, so we can put in a commutator. Similarly, if we switch the order here, we get zero, so we can put in a commutator. All right, well now we might as well just do this. Minus theta x2, zero, minus x2, zero. Okay, now we can even drop the vacuum states, because these, whoops, I said commutator. I meant anti-commutator. These are spin one half. Spin one half. Okay. Now, this anti-commutator is just a number, complex number, and so we can drop the vacuum states completely. And so this is just this. And now we have to evaluate that. So let's evaluate one of these. Now I'm going to use, there are two notations for anti-commutator. One is commutator with a plus sign. The other one is Kirby brackets. 
I'm going to use both so you get used to both. Side plus beta X1 anti-commutative with side bar minus alpha X2 equals, well, it's DQQ, DQQ 2 pi to the 6, 2 EP, 2 EQ, sum as S prime anti-commutator A of P and S, U of P beta S, E minus I P X1, comma, A dagger Q S prime, U bar S prime Q of, no, no, the notes aren't actually wrong, S prime alpha of Q, DIQ X2, end of the anti-commutator. Okay, the anti-commutator gives us 2 pi Q delta S S prime delta Q P minus Q. And so what we get here is integral DQP 2 pi Q 2 P0 or E sub P, whatever you like, sum on S U beta S of P U bar S alpha of P E to the minus I P X1 minus X2. All right, but we computed this over there, namely U U bar is P slash plus M. So this is equal to DQP 2 pi Q 2 P0, notice the relativistically invariant structure, and then what's left here is P slash plus M beta alpha E to the minus I P X1 minus X2. All right. And, all right, I'll just, oh, all right. Well, we're sort of out of time. All right, next time I'll do the rest of this, namely what this term is. And it's a similar structure, but except instead of U's, you get V's. And so you have a P slash minus M, or actually M minus P slash M. Let me see. No, P slash minus M. And then we can rewrite both of them in terms of delta plus, because apart from the P slash structure, this thing has got a plus of X1 minus X2. And then we'll combine the two. And then there's a trick, and we'll eventually get the Feynman propagator. And we'll take the Feynman propagator and put it into the two amplitudes that we computed today and get the final answer. It's a bit of a shorter than questions today. Does anybody want to? Oh, hey, I need to ask you guys something. Finley says we can probably teach 524 if we can find six students who will take it. So we need six volunteers to take it. No, 524 is the second semester of quantum field theory. So in other words, it would be the stuff that we're doing now plus other stuff. And I'm willing to, as I say, choose the subjects to suit the class. It doesn't have to be any particular. All right, so why don't you try to find five others?
try to find that. We're looking good. We're looking good for six. All right. Well, try to send me a list, will you, so I can give it to Finley. In fact, try to get me a list by Wednesday, because... We better put Jonas in charge of this. All right. So somebody get me a list by Wednesday, because we need... Or send me... You guys send me emails. Is... John's not here. John Allen's not here. Okay. All right. So there is... I mean, properly speaking, to do all quantum field theory, you need six semesters. So two is sort of minimal. And I remember... This is just a story. I remember back years ago, this was in the mid-'70s, I was working in Paris at the time. And my mother was living in Boston. Near Boston, so I came over to visit her. And of course, I'm around Harvard to soak up some ideas. And in those days, there were no archive, no internet, no PCs. And it was just the Xerox preprints. Came upon a preprint by Paul Rubia, an experimentalist. And he had a preprint in which he described the standard model, the Higgs mechanism, how the gauge bosons got mass, what a non-abelian gauge theory was, and so forth. He had it all down in clear English. And so what I'm saying here is good experimentalists need Well, let's put this really good. Well, it depends on what the field is. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's, let's talk about the